Hello and welcome. Let's talk today about tissues. Now, basically, we're going to get into the histology aspect of this uh, class. Now, here, um, this introduction to the histology now is going to be basically taking us into tissues and the study of tissues. So here, when we talk tissues, tissues are basically a living fabric is one way to kind of think of it. Now, when we go through and we talk tissues, tissues we talked about in the previous chapter are groups of cells, groups of cells that are going to be similar in structure and perform a common or related function. And we also mentioned the four primary tissue types where basically we said our body gets broken down into one of these four primary tissue types. So you break your body's components down, skin, connective tissue we're going to see. Uh, it's going to be, we've got, again, our, when we talk primary tissue types, here we've got, first let's mention those and we'll uh, basically check out how everything gets broken down. Uh, skin we'll see is connective tissue and it's going to be made up of uh, epithelial tissue as well. Um, and we'll go through, we'll talk again. So uh, we talked primary tissue types, we said are four. So epithelial number one, we saw epithelial as being a lining tissue. And then number two, we said connective tissue. Connective tissue does more than connect, we'll see, mostly providing support. Muscle tissue, we said movement. And the nervous tissue, allowing for internal communication. Okay, internal uh, communication uh, with the internal aspect and also with basically the external components of the body and allowing information to make its way to the CNS and then back from the CNS. Now, when we go through and we talk tissues, so tissues, our body gets broken down into one of these four tissue types, okay? And uh, we'll go through, we'll see all of them, uh, starting with epithelial tissue first. We'll uh, tear apart epithelial tissue, then we'll jump to connective tissue, tear it apart, and then we'll do muscle tissue, tear it completely apart, and then we'll do the same thing with uh, our nervous tissue and tear nervous tissue completely apart as well. So let's start with epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is also known as epithelium. Here this first slide is a nice uh, slide of the epithelial component and also some connective tissue we can appreciate underneath here as well of basically, uh, you'll see the small intestine, the digestive component. So here you can see it's epithelium with the small intestine and showing one certain type of cell here. Right now it may not look... Uh, uh, like uh, anything to you, but once we've gone through the lecture, this will make more sense to you. Okay, and then again here we're going to see a little bit of connective tissue providing its support. So when we go through, we talk epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is also known as epithelium. Epithelium. Now epithelial tissue or epithelium is a sheet of cells it's a sheet, like when you think of a sheet of plywood, a sheet for your bed, okay? So you can think of it as a nice long sheet. So it's a sheet of cells that covers a body surface or lines a body cavity. Now the general forms of epithelial tissue are a couple of types. Number one, Epithelial tissue can be found as a covering and lining epithelium, okay? So tissue, we went through, we talked tissues, we talked histology, and here we broke down all four tissue types. You can see the body gets broken down into these four tissue types. So one good example there. And then again, those four tissue types. So it's important you understand those tissue types. You can see how much we've mentioned them. Again, if you took Bio 107, you've seen these. Uh, this is all review there. All four tissue types, giving you a basic idea. Again, same thing here. Same thing here. Now, we're going to look at these tissues. We're going to study these tissues, and they're basically going to be preserved. So tissues are going to be fixed, and they're preserved. Now, here, how are they made? They're going to be basically cuts. They're going to be cuts of, uh, you know, uh, you'll see tissues from, of organs, basically, that are going to be put onto then slides. They're stained. And then we're going to use the microscope to go through and look at them. So when you talk preparation, preparation includes fixation, the actual section, what is being cut. Now, when you're making these different uh, 
cuts, you can look at bone a couple of different ways. You're looking at bone, you're going to say, yeah, well, here I see a bone, bone, bone. These three images, just bone. But now this bone can be uh, either cut, you can, if you remember, along a longitudinal section. We talked about a couple of longitudinal sections yesterday or in the last uh, chapter, chapter one. And then here you can see, you can have a cross section, a transverse cut, a cut along the transverse plane, or you can have an oblique section. Now, if you were to have a longitudinal section, longitudinal section now will look like this if we were to look at the bone. If we were to cut here and look at the inside of the bone, this is what the inside would look like in there. If we were to do that with a blood vessel, and here you can see what the blood vessel would look like then. We're basically going to be able to look at this end and then this end here. So that's one end here and then the other side of the blood vessel. Now, if we were to make a cut along the transverse, transverse cross section, Turn that around, this is what the bone would look like. So you have to be able to identify bone from here and here, like I was telling you guys uh, uh, in class, uh, same thing with uh, uh, you know students and kind of what we had going on there. Now, blood vessel here, transverse, a cross section, this is what it'll look like. Now, oblique cut, oblique section, this is what the top will look like. Now, here, if we do that to blood vessel, you can see how that would look. So we have various planes of section. So reiterating that chapter. Now same thing with, you can see an egg. If we were to cut along, well here's a mid-sagittal, here's a parasagittal, and here you can see a more laterally placed parasagittal. And what are we going to see there? We can't see any yolk. Here we can see some yolk Mid-sagittal, we can see yolk and the full contour of that egg almost. And then we're going to make a cut along this plane. Again, same thing. Here, same thing we can see with this tubule. And then the same thing here. Right, nice transverse cut. Uh, nice uh, vertical cut, vertical plane. So epithelial tissue, now when we talk epithelial tissue, I said general forms, two types. First type is covering and lining epithelium. Now when we talk covering and lining epithelium, this forms the outer layer of skin. It lines the open cavities of the urogenital, digestive, and respiratory systems. And it covers the walls and organs of the closed ventral body cavities that we spoke of in the previous chapter as well, chapter 1. Second type then is glandular epithelium. Glandular epithelium. Now glandular epithelium forms the glands of the body. It forms the various glands. And you'll see mostly the secretory tissue in our glands. Now let's go through and let's talk general functions. So some general functions we can see are number one, protection. Epithelial cells, they protect underlying tissue. They protect underlying tissue from mechanical injury, from harmful chemicals, pathogens, and excessive water loss, dehydration. Another general function is absorption. Certain epithelial cells lining the small intestine absorb nutrients from the digestion of food. Filtration then is a third function. Filtration. Now filtration is going to be, we'll see a function of the cells in the kidney. When we talk about the kidneys, each kidney is going to contain cells that will be responsible for filtration. Excretion. Excretion is going to be also a function of the cells in the kidneys and also of epithelial cells in our sweat glands. Excretion, they'll be removing from the body. 
not to be confused with secretion. Secretion glands, which are epithelial tissue, are going to secrete specific chemical substances such as enzymes, hormones, and lubricating fluids. When we talk secretion, secretion, we'll see these components are moving from one place in the body to another place in the body. Six, then we can see there's sensory reception. Now we have specialized epithelial cells that are going to detect sensory stimuli. Now when we go through and we talk about epithelial tissue, epithelial tissue I'd like you to know has some special characteristics. Here are some special characteristics we can see. Number one is that epithelial tissue is going to have polarity. We'll go through and we'll talk about each of them and specialized contacts. We'll talk about the support that epithelial tissue receives from connective tissue as I've been mentioning now a few times. We'll also talk about how epithelial tissue is avascular However, it is innervated, and it has, the, it has a regenerative capacity. It has a high regenerative capacity. It can regenerate. So let's talk first polarity. I would like you to know all epithelial cells have an apical and basal surface is basically what we're saying when we say that epithelial tissue has polarity. So cells have polarity in an apical surface and a basal surface. The apical surface is the upper or the free surface. It's the upper or the free surface. It's the surface that is exposed to the body's exterior or to the cavity. Or, so it's the surface that's exposed to the body's exterior or the surface that's exposed to the cavity of an internal organ. Now this apical surface, it can be smooth and slick, or it can have a couple of, we'll see modifications there. So if we were to look at this row of cells, now if we're to look at this row of cells, you can see here this basically top part of the cells is the apical surface. <clears throat> I like to think of a apical for attic, it's in the top, okay? So if we're talking about, uh, let's say, this down here now, apical surface we can see right up inside of here. So again, it's a surface that's exposed to the exterior or into the cavity of an internal organ. Next then, we have the basal surface. Now the basal surface is the lower or the attached surface. So here you can see now, the surface right down here, basal surface. Okay, so that's what we say when we say epithelial tissue has polarity, has two surfaces. Now when we go through and we talk about the apical surface, I told you the apical surface can be smooth and slick, or this apical surface can have microvilli to it, or it can have microvilli to it, it could be smooth and slick, or it can have microvilli to it. Now, when we talk microvilli, microvilli are going to be finger-like extensions. They are finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane. Now, what they do is they increase the surface area. Microvilli increase the surface area. Now, in epithelia that absorb, in epithelia that absorb and secrete substances like your intestines and or your tubules of the kidneys, microvilli is so dense that the apical cells, those apical cells basically surface there is going to have a fuzzy appearance. So that microvilli is so dense that the cells Apical surfaces, the apices, have a fuzzy appearance. And we refer to that surface there as the brush border. The brush border. So when we talk brush border, brush border 
is going to be the regions of the intestinal lining or we said uh, in the kidney tubules where you have microvilli its apical surface to be very very dense very dense <clears throat> that we call it brush border it's very important because uh, in the small intestine we're going to have a lot of enzymes there and those enzymes are going to be basically ready to go and break down whatever uh, component makes its way through the uh, digestive tract let's say for example when we talk lactase lactase is a brush border enzyme it's responsible for breaking down lactose which is a uh, milk uh, which is a sugar that we find in milk so correct yeah people don't have it are going to be lactose intolerant because they are lactase deficient so microvilli and now here when we talk microvilli we can see here so microvilli are finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane so here let's say let's go back to this picture I don't have to draw anything in <clears throat> right inside of here now right inside of here this structure itself okay this structure itself you see here is a villi now the villi has this microvilli right inside of here see the right inside of here if we were to look at one of these cells now basically here you can see this one villi is made up of a whole bunch of different cells. We look at this one cell. This is the apical surface of that cell. Down here, this is the basal surface of that cell, right? We've established that already. So here at that apical surface, we said it could be smooth and slick or it can have microvilli there. So these are the microvilli. If we were to zoom in here, okay, or let's zoom in on basically this whole cell right here. This is what it would look like. You got the nucleus right inside here. It's important you know the nucleus. A lot of students come to anatomy and aren't sure about the nucleus, which is what you learn from bio. And then right on top of here, okay, here we're going to have basically surface looking like this. So if I was to zoom in here now, this is what that would look like. You can see here. Now, what this does is it increases the surface area. Why would we want to have that surface area increased in digestion? We're trying to digest. So when we're trying to digest, we want to make sure we can absorb everything we need from there. Okay, so that's what that surface looks like there. Now, you can have either this microvilli. So microvilli are going to be finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane. They increase the surface area. In epithelia that absorb and secrete substances, microvilli, we said, is so dense that the cell apices have this fuzzy appearance. You can see here, and we refer to it as brush border. We call it brush border. If there's no microvilli there, we can also have here cilia. So that surface can have if there's a no microvilli there, if it's not smooth and slick, we can also have their cilia. Cilia are tiny hair-like projections, tiny hair-like projections that propel substances along their free surface. They're found on some epithelia, such as epithelia that you find lining the trachea, for example, your windpipe. And now here, this is what the cilia will look like. Now here we've got the cell, let's just say. And now here, these are going to be tiny hair-like projections. Now before we said we had microvilli. Microvilli are totally different from cilia. Okay, so make sure you fully read and understand the difference there. Tiny hair-like projections versus we described as finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane. 
So they're going to help to push things along the surface. That's why the windpipe, when we're breathing, right? Well, and I always joke, uh, you know, we don't walk around wearing masks. Lo and behold, the times we're in, um, you know, we are wearing masks now. Um, I used to joke around with my students and say we should apply for a, a, an EPA deductible every year when we fill out taxes saying if we breathe, we should get a certain cut because what we're actually doing is we're filtering the air, right, by bringing in all the pollutants and everything, allowing them to come in here, stick in here, and then cleaning the air and sending it back out. Now, here, the cilia is basically there to help remove particles that may make their way in that we are not able to see, and uh, that's the importance there of cilia. Very, very important. Next in here we can see we have specialized contacts. So the second characteristic is specialized contacts. Now when we talk specialized contacts, we're going to see tight junctions and we will see desmosomes. Tight junctions and desmosomes. What they do is they bind adjacent cells together and help maintain polarity. So these Contacts are going to be found between adjacent cells. And they bind adjacent cells. The tight junctions, obviously, really in a tight fashion. We'll go through as a semester progressing. We'll actually see pictures of each of these as well. And then you have other lateral contacts known as desmosomes. And then in certain cells, we're going to see in between these contacts, we will have then what we call... Um, basically gap junctions, like in relation to cardiac muscle cells. Next, I would like you to know that when we talk, um, uh, epithelial tissue is supported by connective tissue. Epithelial tissue is supported by connective tissue. So nosy, sitting at home. Now, when we talk... Um, uh, supported by connective tissue, all epithelial tissue rests upon, all epithelial tissue rests upon, and is supported by connective tissue. Now we have here reticular lamina. Reticular lamina is going to be a layer of extracellular material. It's a layer of extracellular material containing a fine network of collagen fibers that belong to the connective tissue. Now here, we're going to be able to appreciate... Did we talk about... Basal surface. We skipped the basal surface. So after cilia, actually, we were supposed to talk about the basal surface. So let's jump back up back up to the first characteristic of uh, the apical surface. Now, uh, we skipped the basal surface totally. So let's go back. Basal surface, we said, is a lower or the attached surface. So I get for being nosy, I guess. It's a lower <clears throat> or the attached surface. So when you talk and compare the apical versus basal surface, both surfaces are going to differ in structure and function. Obviously, because of look at what they have. Apical surface, if it has uh, microvilli, it's going to be involved with absorption there, right? And if we're talking cilia, it's going to be involved with moving things along. Now, the basal surface is the attached surface. So here, what we have at the basal surface, you can see is going to be now basically basal lamina. Now, basal lamina is a non-cellular, thin supporting sheet of collagen, I'm sorry, collagen fibers and glycoproteins. It's a thin supporting sheet of glycoproteins and collagen fibers. And it's found lying adjacent to the basal surface. It's found lying adjacent to the basal surface. And it's an adhesive sheet. It acts as a selective filter. It acts as a selective filter. And it determines which molecules can cross from the connective tissue up into the epithelial tissue. Which 
molecules can cross from the epithelial tissue, uh, from the connective tissue up into the epithelial tissue. So now we've taken care of the apical and the basal surfaces. So the apical surface is up here. This is where you can have the cilia or you can have microvilli here. Down here is where you find the basal surface and where you find the basal lamina. Okay, same thing right down in here. Basal surface, where you find the basal lamina. So basal surface, I think of basement. Attic, the top of the house, and then basement. And then specialized contacts, right, we took care of. Now this third uh, uh, characteristic I was telling you guys about now is that epithelial tissue is going to be supported by connective tissue. Now, all epithelial tissue rests and is supported, is resting upon and is supported by connective tissue. Now, here we have our reticular lamina. The reticular lamina is a layer of extracellular material. It's a layer of extracellular material that's going to contain a fine network of collagen fibers that are going to belong to the connective tissue, that will belong to the connective tissue. So you've got basal lamina, and then deep to the basal lamina, the reticular lamina now. Now when we talk basement membrane, Basement membrane is formed from the two laminae. So when we consider the two laminae, the basal lamina and the reticular lamina, we refer to that as the basement membrane. Basement membrane is going to be important when we get to the kidneys for you to know. Now the basement membrane, what it does, it reinforces the epithelial sheet and also helps it to resist stretching and tearing and helps it to resist stretching and tearing. And it basically defines the epithelial boundary there. So everything above there is going to be epithelial tissue and below it, connective tissue. Next we said epithelial tissue is avascular but innervated. So when we say avascular, we're saying it contains no blood vessels. contains no blood vessels. <clears throat> so it contains no blood vessels, so it's avascular. And it is supplied by nerve fibers. It is supplied by nerve fibers. If you've ever cut yourself, okay, so superficial, you've seen sometimes it doesn't bleed, but with me I'll notice a skin color change. I'll notice it goes from being a dark to being light. I know, okay, I've cut myself, but it wasn't that deep. All I did was just cut the epithelial aspect. So epithelial tissue is avascular, but innervated. Meaning it contains no blood vessels, but it is supplied by nerve fibers. So if it doesn't have blood vessels, it has to be nourished by diffusion from underlying connective tissue. Next then is regeneration. Epithelial tissue has a high regenerative capacity. It has a high regenerative capacity. We see that when we see skin sloughing, or if you cut yourself, right? You don't walk around with a cut for the rest of your life. That'd be horrible. And again, we're shedding our skin constantly. Dead skin is falling off. So these are all special characteristics in relation to epithelial tissue. Now when we go through and we talk epithelial tissue, so all special characteristics. Now when we go through and we talk about epithelial tissue, all epithelium, each epithelium is going to have two names, has two names. The first name indicates the number of cell layers the first name 
is going to indicate the number of cell layers. And the second name is going to describe the shape of its cells. So when we talk epithelial tissue, epithelial is going to have, you'll see at least two names. First name is going to describe the number of cell layers. And then the second name is going to indicate the shape of the cells. So when we go through and we talk about covering and lining epithelium, we'll go through general classifications. And here we'll generally classify our epithelium according to the number of cell layers first. When we classify epithelium according to the number of cell layers, we'll see we have two major classifications here. Your epithelia can be classified as either being simple epithelia. Now, if we're talking simple epithelia, simple epithelia is going to be epithelium that is going to be found as just a single cell layer, just one cell layer. Simple epithelia is typically found where absorption, secretion, and filtration are going to occur, right? Because in those areas, you don't want to have a thick layer. You want to have just a single cell layer. The second classification is stratified epithelium. We talk stratified epithelium. At stratified epithelium is going to be composed of two or more cell layers. Two or more cell layers where the cells are stacked on top of each other. Stratified epithelium. Stratified epithelium is going to be common in areas of high abrasion, in areas that suffer high abrasion. So high abrasion areas where protection is important, like the skin surface, like the skin surface, and the mouth, we'll say, for example. And we'll learn more as we progress. So those areas you want stratified versus just a single layer of cells. So the first name is going to be either, now we'll see, simple epithelia or stratified epithelia. Let's add the second name instead of epithelia. So when we talk second name, now the cell shape is what we're going to be looking at here. Now, when we talk cell shape, we have either squamous cells, which are going to be flattened and scale-like cells. So one image there, another image here. Squamous cells you can have, which are going to be flattened and scale-like cells. Or you can have cuboidal cells, which you can see are box-like cells. They are as tall as they are wide. Columnar cells. Columnar cells. These are tall and column-shaped cells. Tall and column-shaped cells. So let's specifically classify then epithelium. Now when we uh, specifically classify epithelium, we're going to have first simple squamous epithelium. Okay, we'll talk first simple epithelia, then we'll take care of stratified epithelia. So first simple uh, epithelia, you have a simple squamous epithelia. When we talk simple squamous epithelia, you have to be able to describe it, know its functions and locations. I can ask you any of that stuff on the exam and you have to be able to uh, answer those questions. So when we talk about description, simple, simple, we said one single layer, squamous, flat, squished cells. So when we describe simple squamous epithelia, you can see it's going to be described as a single layer of flattened cells with disc-shaped central nuclei. These cells will have a very sparse cytoplasm. And they are the simplest epithelia that you'll see. They are the simplest epithelia we'll see. Now when you talk about the function of Simple squamous epithelia, simple squamous epithelia, it allows for the passage of materials. It allows for the passage of materials by diffusion. 
And it's involved with filtration, where protection is not important. And it's also going to be secreting lubricating substances in our cirrhosis. Where do you find this type of epithelia? This epithelia is going to be found in the glomeruli of the kidneys. The kidneys have a region called the glomeruli, if you recall, from 107. If not, here you can see we have basically this structure here. If you talk about the kidneys, the structural functional unit of the kidneys is going to be called the nephron. So here is an image of the nephron. Now everybody is responsible for knowing about this nephron. It's complete fair game. And so you could go through and understand all the different parts of this nephron. Here you have, right inside of here, a whole bunch of blood vessels. And this is where blood comes into, gets filtered, whatever needs to be removed gets removed, Whatever doesn't get removed, it's going to get sent back into your circulation through this blood vessel. So this vessel here is the glomeruli. When we talk, kidney glomeruli is one area where you're going to find it. You're also going to find it in this parietal layer. We're going to see, uh, um, I'm sorry, here we're going to see this layer right in here is going to be found attached basically right on top of this glomeruli okay so here I've kind of exaggerated this difference here okay this is all attached we'll see all together this all makes up your filtration membrane this side here and then this side in here and everything in between now right inside of here this is all going to be we'll see now basically these simple squamous epithelial cells all out right side of here and then right inside of here because this layer is not that thick and here what's going to happen is right inside of here is we'll, where filtration will take place okay so the substances will make their way out in here and right when they're in here they're going to be passed along into here so one major area where you're going to find this epithelia is going to be in here but then we progress through we talk the kidneys glomeruli and we get into the nephron, we talk uh, the nephron in greater detail, we'll talk glomeruli and all these other parts there. We'll look at these cells and we'll see them right outside of here as well. So here you can see then, uh, make sure you know that nephron uh, there also. Now, another area where we're going to see is going to be this image like we're seeing here. These are the air sacs inside the lungs. Inside the lungs, you see when we make our way all the way through, all the way to the end, we have our air sacs. Now here, one side of the air sac you have air, the other side is going to be blood. Here you had a blood and basically solute membrane here. And here we're going to have blood and air membrane. So here, why do we not want to have thick layer? Because we're trying to get gases to move across, right? Diffusion is the word we keep saying. Diffusion means something you learned in bio. So just that one word is saying a lot. Okay, movement from high to low. Right? And that's exactly what we're going to be seeing here with oxygen and CO2. So, air sacs of the lungs, lining of the heart, lining of your blood vessels, the lining of your lymphatic vessels, and also your ventral body cavity lining that we saw, the cirrhosis, simple squamous epithelium. Next then we have endo Endothelium. When we use the term endothelium, endothelium is still simple squamous epithelium. Now, we get cute, we get fancy, whatever you want to call it in science, and we start to give specific things names. Now, endothelium is going to be the specific name for the simple squamous epithelia found lining our lymphatic vessels, our blood vessels, and our heart. So if I was to ask you, we were to show you a picture and show you that lining and say, what do you have here? You would have to say this is endothelium, which is 
simple squamous epithelium found lining the blood vessel or lymphatic vessel. Another term is mesothelium. I'm sure you've heard mesothelioma on TV. Mesothelium is going to be, again, simple squamous epithelium. Now, this is uh, simple squamous epithelium found in relation to our serous membranes. The membranes that are lining the ventral body cavity and covering its organs that we discussed in Chapter 1. We call that mesothelium. So you, you've probably seen these commercials. Uh, lawyers, uh, do you suffer from mesothelioma? Have you worked in a shipyard? Or uh, here, here, here. And um, they're helping patients to receive compensation, I guess. But mesothelium is what's affected. So you have to understand then what mesothelioma is. Okay? Because it's affecting the mesothelium. Next then, let's move. And here you can actually appreciate more images of simple squamous epithelium. Let's come back in here. Here you can actually see one little squish cell right inside of here. And then here you can see the nucleus inside in purple. And if you look at right next to it, another squish cell, the nucleus in purple, another cell, but this nucleus didn't stay in purple. It's a slide. It's not going to be picture perfect. Sometimes you may not even have a nucleus there. And you have to recall and use your information and identify that as whatever cell it is. So here you can see all basically just one single layer of cells. Here you can see the same thing, simple squamous epithelium. Another simple squamous epithelial cell, 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 simple squamous, simple squamous, simple squamous. All connective tissue underneath here, providing support as we mentioned. So you can see the apical surface would be right up here and the basal surface would be down there. Now in mesothelia, in mesothelium and endothelium, I'll never ask you to identify apical surface and basal surface because you're looking at the apical surface. When we move to the lab, I'll show you that in the lab. Other than that, if I show you a picture like this, you should be able to identify apical surface and basal surface. So again, here's some muscle and connective tissue, all down here providing support to the epithelium up here. So two other locations, endothelium and mesothelium. Let's move then to simple cuboidal epithelium. When we talk simple cuboidal epithelium, again description, simple single cell, single layer of cube-like cells with large spherical central nuclei. The function is secretion and absorption. So here you can see some of those cells, the nuclei didn't stain here, but you can see one cell, okay, this is a cube, Right? Here we said equal height and width. So one cube-shaped cell. Here's another one. Another one, another one, another one, but no nuclei. That's okay. Here you can see here's another one with nuclei. So that's enough for you to understand you have simple cuboidal epithelium. Same thing here. These few didn't stain that well. Here's a little light one. Here you can see very well. And then coming all the way around. These cells are going to be found in the kidney's tubules, the ducts, and the secretory portion of our small glands, and also the ovary surface, and also the ovary surface. So the kidney tubules coming back here to the nephron. These are the tubules. This is one set of tubules, proximal convoluted tubule. Here's another set, distal convoluted tubule. And here's the loop of Henle, another set of tubules. So you got to make sure you know all the parts and the collecting ducts at the end. This is inside the kidney. Each of your kidneys have millions of these tiny blood processing units that are called nephrons. Okay, we're going to talk more about them. This class is so much fun. So here you can see simple cuboidal epithelium.
Next thing we have simple columnar epithelium. Simple columnar, so single layer of tall cells with round to oval nuclei. And some of these cells can have cilia. And this layer we'll see can also contain goblet cells, which are a type of mucus secreting unicellular gland. One celled gland called goblet cells. And we'll look at those and we'll check those out as well. Now, the function of these simple columnar epithelia is absorption. Now, if you have cilia, there we'll see it's helping to move things along. Absorption, secretion, secretion of mucus. We can see secretion of enzymes and also secretion of other substances. Now, if we talk ciliated type, the ciliated type, we said, is going to be responsible for sending or propelling substances forward. Now, where do we find this type of epithelia? So if we're talking ciliated types, ciliated types we'll see in reproductive cells, the uterine tubes, more specifically speaking, and some regions of the uterus. Also, lining the small bronchi. And lining the small bronchi. Now, the non-ciliated type, the type that does not have cilia, the non-ciliated type is going to be found lining most of the digestive tract most of the digestive tract, from the stomach to the anal canal, the gallbladder, and then the excretory ducts of some of the glands will have the ciliated type there as well, the non-ciliated type there. So this is all simple columnar epithelium. Next, then, let's move to pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So, simple columnar. Here we can appreciate some goblet cells, three of them. And again, column-shaped cells. And here they've got, some have microvilli to them. Next, then, look at, let's look at these pseudostratified Let's move over here. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Now, when we talk pseudostratified, pseudo is the word we want to break down. Pseudo means fake, right? Stratified. So it's a fake stratified, meaning it looks like it's stratified, but it's not. So if you look at this picture, you can see it does look stratified, but it's not stratified. So this cell, uh, epithelial cell, basically is going to be described as a single layer of cells of differing heights. Some cells are taller than others. So those cells that are taller than others are going to reach the free surface, while others may not. Now, because of that, the nuclei are going to be seen at different levels. And these cells, you can see also sometimes will have mucus secreting cells. And sometimes we can also find cilia here as well. Now, when you talk about the function, secretion, particularly secretion of mucus, and then propulsion of mucus, thanks to the cilia. Now, when you talk locations, so if you have non-ciliated, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, it's found in the male's sperm-carrying ducts. Why would you, why, why do we need non-ciliated. Our sperm have cilia, so they swim where they need to go. Fallopian tubes, we saw, 
are going to have ciliated. Because the egg doesn't have a cilia. And the ciliated type is going to help move that egg forward. So sperm carrying ducts and the ducts of large glands, non ciliated types. The ciliated pseudo stratified columnar epithelium is going to be found lining the trachea, found lining the trachea and most of the upper respiratory tract, and most of the upper respiratory tract. Next, then let's jump to stratified epithelium. Stratified epithelium. Now we talk stratified epithelium, let's talk first stratified squamous epithelium. When we talk stratified squamous epithelium, stratified, many layers, so it's a thick membrane composed of several cell layers. Now the basal cells, the cells closer to the bottom, closer to the basal surface, those basal cells, they are going to be cuboidal or columnar in shape. They are cuboidal to columnar in shape, and they are metabolically active cells. Now, these cells are going to be cuboidal shaped. So you're not going to use those to identify this tissue because then you're going to call it cuboidal epithelium when it's not. Here you can see the surface cells. These surface cells you see up here, these cells, you can see now they are flat. They're flat, they're squished, and they're squamous shaped. These are the cells you're going to look at to determine this as being stratified squamous epithelium. When we talk stratified squamous epithelium, we have keratinized and non-keratinized. In the keratinized type, the surface cells are going to be full of keratin. All of these cells, they're going to be full of keratin and they're dead. But here, as we can see, this is more of the non-keratinized type. And so we don't see those dead cells. And those basal cells are active in mitosis, as we've described, and they're going to be producing these cells that move up to the superficial layers. So what's the function of having all of these cells? The function is that these cells are all going to protect. They're going to protect the underlying tissues in areas that are subject to abrasion. Right, so we don't need those uh, cells, this type of tissue inside of the lungs. Now the non-keratinized type is going to form the moist lining of the esophagus, the mouth, and the vagina. The keratinized type, the keratinized type forms the epidermis of the skin, which is a dry membrane. Should make sense. Next in stratified cuboidal epithelium. So some more images of stratified squamous. Here you have keratinized and non-keratinized. Here's all the dead cells that are packed with keratin. You see right outside of here. We don't have that here. These cells are all living. They have the nuclei inside of them. These cells don't have any nuclei. So when we talk stratified cuboidal epithelium and stratified columnar epithelium, they're both quite rare in the body. Stratified cuboidal epithelium is found in some sweat glands and mammary glands. And the stratified columnar limited distribution throughout the body. Next on, let's talk transitional epithelium. When we talk transitional epithelium, here we can appreciate transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium is going to be described as epithelium that resembles both stratified squamous and stratified cuboidal. 
Stratified squamous because it looks like many cells. And up here you can see one row of flat squished cells. Stratified cuboidal because these look like a whole bunch of cubish shaped cells on top of each other. The basal cells are cuboidal or columnar. And the surface cells you see up here, the surface cells are dome-shaped or squamous-like cells. And that's all going to be depending on the degree of organ stretch. Because if this organ is being stretched, that those dome-shaped cells are going to be pushed down then because of everything being stretched versus them being here and being on the top. So if we were to stretch it, those cells are going to start moving down then. The function of this tissue that is that it stretches. It stretches readily and permits distension of urinary organs by contained urine. So the location where you find this type of epithelium, lining your ureters, the tubes that take urine from the kidneys to the bladder, the urinary bladder also has transitional epithelium, and then part of the urethra. Also, you're going to find lining in here, transitional epithelium. Remember, it's a lining type of tissue, epithelium is. So let's talk then more image of transitional. Same thing here. So here we can just see nice uh, epithelial cells right up inside of here. So here then let's talk glands. Let's talk glandular epithelium. Now we talk glandular epithelium. Glands, I want you to know, consist of one or more cells that make and secrete a secretion, which is a water-based fluid that usually contains proteins, lipids, or steroids. Now, generally classifying our glands, glands are classified according to two sets of traits. The location of the secretion, number one, where they secrete their products. And then number two, we'll see the number of cells. So when we talk first, location of secretion. When we talk location of secretion, we classify our glands into two categories. Our glands are going to be classified as being either endocrine glands or exocrine glands. When we talk about our endocrine glands, endocrine glands are internally secreting glands. They're going to secrete into the interstitial fluid or into the blood. Second are exocrine glands. Exocrine glands, as we see here, they are externally secreting glands. They secrete their secretions onto a surface or into a cavity. Onto a surface or into a cavity. Now, we can also classify our glands according to the number of cells. When we classify our glands according to the number of cells, we can see we can classify our glands as being either unicellular glands, which is what we're seeing here, one-celled glands, or they can be multicellular glands, where they're made up of many cells. So let's talk specific classification. When we talk specific classification, we have first exocrine glands. Exocrine glands, they secrete their products onto a body surface, the skin, for example, or into body cavities. Examples of exocrine glands will include mucus glands, sweat glands, oil glands, salivary glands, the liver, and the pancreas. Now, when we talk exocrine glands, we said exocrine glands, we have unicellular and we can have multicellular. Now, when we talk unicellular exocrine glands, an example are mucus cells or goblet cells. These glands are sprinkled in the epithelium lining of the intestinal and respiratory tracts, as we've talked about between columnar cells. So goblet cells, one example of unicellular exocrine glands. 
And then the multicellular exocrine glands we can see here and we see here are glands that are composed of a duct, not a quack quack duct, not D-U-C-K, D-U-C-T, a duct and a secretory unit, a secretory unit, secreting component basically. So let's talk about the different components. First we have the duct. So here you can see the surface epithelium, and then here's the duct, right? The color is all color coordinated for you. So the duct, the duct, the duct, the duct, and the ducts we see here, the ducts you see here, and the ducts you see here. So when we talk about the duct, the duct you can have a couple of different types. You can have either a simple duct or a compound duct. The simple duct is a duct that has basically unbranching to it, no branching to it. So simple ducts have unbranched ducts to them. Now when you talk about compound ducts, compound ducts, they're going to have a branched duct to them. They will have a branched duct. So here you can see simple ducts, no branching. Simple duct, just here and here, no branching. Here, the duct, the duct, and then look, it branches down to here, the duct and the duct. So these are compound ducts versus simple, 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 simple. Now, the second part is the secretory unit. We talk about the secretory unit. The secretory unit can be either tubular, where it looks or it forms, you can see the secretory cells are going to form tubes. Tubes, tubular. Or they can be alveolar. Or they can be alveolar. Where the secretory cells form small flask-like sacs. Small flask-like sacs. Or you can have a mixture of the two. You can have tubulo alveolar secretory units where you see both alveolar, tubular, alveolar, alveolar, tubular, alveolar, alveolar, tubular, alveolar. So types of exocrine secretions, serous glands, they secrete thin watery fluids. Mucous glands secrete mucus that absorbs water to form mucus basically. Mixed glands secrete a mix of watery and mucus secretions. And we talk cytogenic glands, they release whole cells. Examples, ovaries, releasing the cells. And we talk modes of secretion, methods of exocrine secretions. Now how these glands secrete their products. These glands can either be merocrine glands, like our eccrine glands, where they secrete their products by exocytoses, you learned in bio. Exocytoses is going to be vesicular transport out of the cell. For example, the pancreas, most sweat glands, and salivary glands. We can also have halocrine glands, which are glands that will accumulate their products within them until they rupture. For example, we have sebaceous or our oil glands. And then third, we have apocrine glands. Apocrine glands, here we can see, they'll basically form droplets that bud from the surface. And mammary and axillary glands will be examples of apocrine glands. And here we can see merocrine secretions, apocrine secretions, and then here we have halocrine secretions. Now here we have tissue growth and development. Some terms I want you to be familiar with as well when we talk about tissue growth or in relation to tissue growth. We have first this term hyperplasia where we talk about cell multiplication. Hypertrophy where you talk about an enlargement of the cells. So here's cell multiplication versus an enlargement of cells. Two different things. And then neoplasia, tumor development. And then changes 
you can have a couple of different types of differentiation where we have a specialization of one form or function or you can have metaplasia then where you have a change from one tissue to another and then a couple of terms for repair regeneration and fibrosis regeneration is a replacement of dead cells fibrosis then is a scar tissue formation and then here's some terms in relation to shrinkage and death of cells, atrophy or tissues, reduction in the number of end size, necrosis, pathological death of the tissue, and it could be due to infarction or gangrene where the blood supply is cut off in infarction or you have insufficient blood supply like with necrosis and gangrene. Or then the term apoptosis, where you have programmed cell death. And here you can see the gangrene and necrosis.